Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today my guest is Father David Neuhaus. David is currently the superior of the Jesuits in the Holy Land, and is currently the uh, interim director of the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Jerusalem. From 2009 to 2017, David served as vicar for the Hebrew speaking Catholics in the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem. David, welcome. Thank you very much, Roberto. The first question, and the only one that I ask to all of my guests is, David, what, what is your Jerusalem? In other words, what is your connection with the city? So not an easy question to answer because I feel like I'm connected to the city in many different ways. I think people with complex identities tend to relate to Jerusalem in different ways. So I relate to you something that just took place a few days ago as I was walking through the Muslim part of the old city, the month of Ramadan, the streets full of people, a real atmosphere of of excitement, people out on the streets, of course, masked. And despite all the tension, a kind of festive atmosphere as around nine o'clock in the evening, people have fasted the whole day going out in the street, greeting their neighbors. And we went especially to see the lights, the wonderful lights that people decorate their homes with at the time of Ramadan. This is certainly one of the Jerusalems. And of course, as I've lived in the city for many, many years, having chosen to make this city my residence, not being born here, I think that in a particular way, I'm aware of how diverse Jerusalem is, how many Jerusalems there are, how as you live here, and I think it is unending, at least I've been here now, I think 44 years, and still I feel like each time I walk the street, perhaps not each time, that's probably a hyperbole, but many times when I walk the streets, a new layer is revealed, a new aspect of Jerusalem, something that I haven't seen, that somehow interconnects with one particular characteristic of Jerusalem. And so it's an eternal exploration of a very, very exciting city. Many previous guests of the podcast related to what you are saying and uh, describe the city also through colors, smells, sounds. So I was wondering when you when you walk around the city, since you are able to pick up all of these different layers, are there any specific colors or smells or sounds that define the places you are in and that you are walking around? So it's interesting that you say that because I think that the first thing I would say is the smells. Ah, the smells, the particularity of the smells relating to the particular sections of Jerusalem that you're in. And when I say smells, I usually mean wonderful smells, smells that really draw you in. Uh, And I don't know if I'm the kind of person who is first attracted by smell, but certainly it's the smell then that leads to me looking around and seeing the colors and then hearing the sounds. So, of course, there is religious Jerusalem in all of its diversity, but there is also ethnic Jerusalem and um, political Jerusalem and economic Jerusalem. So one of the things I personally love to do when people say to me, let's go for a work, where should we go? Whatever time of the day or night it is, I say, let's go to the marketplaces. Because somehow the marketplaces for me are the place are the places where much of what is separate gets integrated as people rub shoulders in the marketplaces. So I love to go also to visit people in their homes, visit the various neighborhoods. But somehow, I think in Jerusalem, walking through the marketplaces, whether it's in the old city of Jerusalem or in the Jewish market of Machane Yehuda, there is something there that brings things together. And also through smell and color and sound, uh, 
smelling the smell of a marketplace is smelling the people who are walking around in the marketplace, also through the types of food they buy, the types of meals they cook, uh, the smell of the people, uh, which is absolutely, for me, something very attractive, uh, to smell somebody next to me and to know that this person is dressed in a particular way, uh, is for me very much what Jerusalem is. It's fascinating always to get uh, details about how people see the city and relate to the city itself. You briefly mentioned something um, many may know, but I suppose many don't know, that you have multiple identities. Your official biography says that you moved to Jerusalem when you were 15. But in fact, despite you are now a Catholic priest, in fact, the you're a Jesuit and you're leading the Jesuit community in the Holy Land, but you were born Jewish. Can you tell us how you, you know, sort of the path that led you to the conversion and also to what extent, if any, in fact, Jerusalem played a role in that conversion? So Jerusalem not only played a role, Jerusalem is the stage on which this story unfolded. So I came to Jerusalem at the age of 15. Until 15, I lived in Johannesburg, South Africa, the son of uh, German Jews who fled the Nazi regime, arrived in South Africa in 1936 and sent me away from South Africa at the age of 15 because of the political turmoil in South Africa. <clears throat> they being very much opposed to the apartheid regime and sent me off to Jerusalem thinking, well, here we are, we're sending our son to the homeland of the Jewish people. My parents were not very ideological and perhaps not even very well informed about the situation in Israel. So I arrived at the age of 15 and within two weeks of my arrival, the story started to unfold. I arrived in Jerusalem. I was in a boarding school with other kids like me, 15 year olds from South Africa sent by their parents to get a good Jewish education and to fall in love with Israel, the state of Israel and everything that that might mean for some Jews in that period of history. Uh, two weeks after my arrival, it was a Saturday. I remember the day very, very well. It was a Saturday in September of 1977. I broke out of the boarding school and went off in search of a fascinating historical personality that I had read about and realized that there were people in Jerusalem who had actually known her. She was a Romanov, a Russian a grand duchess who had been killed by the Bolsheviks in 1918 and living in Jerusalem were a number of persons who had known her. And off I went to the Russian Orthodox convent on the top of the Mount of Olives walking on a Saturday afternoon when all of my fellow students were taking their siesta after having spent the morning in the synagogue praying. And it was on that day that I met the person who was the first person who spoke to me about faith, about Jesus, about the church, and I was absolutely captivated. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details, but it's that meeting that really set me on a path that has brought me probably right until today. Um, what captivated me was her joy. She was a very, very old, paralyzed Russian Orthodox nun who was radiant with joy. Another Jerusalem personality. As I discovered much later, she was a very well-known person in the Orthodox Church of Jerusalem, a spiritual guide, a strong leader of the, of the monastery of nuns where she was in charge. And <clears throat> I went back to see her repeatedly as I tried to understand who was the source of her joy. And of course, she would name him Jesus, and I wanted to get to know him as well, another Jerusalem personality. And by the time I left Jerusalem to go visit my parents, I had already the question formulated, and that was, I want to be a Christian. How am I going to do that? My Jewish parents, of course, were horrified. And when I realized the extent of their horror in the one question my mother asked, which was, 
how can you join them after what they did to us? Again, I repeat, my parents fled Europe, Nazi Germany, very much perceived the Christians as part of the problem and could never be part of the solution. I made a promise to my parents that I would do nothing for 10 years. I would wait for 10 years. But if this was true when I was 25, they would accept. And so that was the agreement. I stuck very much to the agreement, went back to Jerusalem, did not stop frequenting the Christian world. And so, yes, I was brought up in the Jewish world and came to Jerusalem and got to know well the world of Jerusalem that is Jewish, but was now on the search of, of uh, what, is, what is Christianity? Where uh, is Jesus in this Christian world? And <clears throat> my mother's question led me from church to church. It became, in a certain sense, my question. How could I, as a Jew, become a Christian? But something else went wrong, which I think went right. But, you know, in the way that you want to lay out a linear story, something else went wrong. Because at that same time that I'm searching uh, for this Jesus person, I met the person who became my best friend, a man two years older than I am, who is a Muslim Palestinian. And this Muslim Palestinian, again, a Jerusalem personality, his family, many, many generations in Jerusalem, him a real Jerusalemite, met me. And when we had become kind of friendly, he said, where is your family? And I said, my family, my family lives in South Africa. And he said, what? H how can you not live with a family? And he took me immediately into his own family home, introduced me to his mother and father, his father now deceased and said to me, this is your mother and father. And from that moment on, I felt kind of integrated into this Muslim milieu that has become as much mine as the Jewish and Christian milieu in which I circulated. My mother, until today, my Muslim mother speaks nothing but Arabic. And so immediately I realized, I was then in my teens, realized I have to learn Arabic. If I am to be a a resident of Jerusalem, Hebrew is excellent, English important, Arabic essential. And so I started a long process of learning colloquial, then classical Arabic to read and to write, and also to get to know Jerusalem in Arabic. Ah, with Usama at my side, Usama is my brother. Ah, um, he became an integral part of my life as his family did. And seeing Jerusalem through Jewish eyes, Christian eyes, and Muslim eyes became kind of a way of living in Jerusalem and realizing how privileged that is that so few can do that. And perhaps fewer and fewer as the city becomes more and more polarized, I realized that in the past people had gone from community to community. This was brought home to me one day, many, many years later, driving back from teaching in Bejala on uh, the feast day of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. The Israelis had closed down the checkpoints to anyone under 65. Only old people could get through the checkpoints. And just getting through the checkpoint, I picked up an old lady in Palestinian dress, carrying a big, big basket of fruit on her head, and by that time, speaking pretty fluent Arabic, I said to her grandmother, come with me, where are you going? And she said, I need to get to Jerusalem. Why do you need to get to Jerusalem? I have to sell this fruit. And I said, well, what's going on? I pretended I was an idiot. I didn't know what was going on. I was dressed, of course, as a Catholic priest. I said, grandmother, what's going on? Why is everything closed? And she looked at me with this kind of sad look and she said, oh, my son, of course. You're too young to know. And I said, too young to know what, grandmother? And she said, well, too young to remember the time when we went to each other's houses on the feasts. And she proceeded to tell me all about the Feast of Sukkot in amazing detail, dragging up the details from her memory of going to visit the sukkah of her Jewish neighbors, which would have been before 1948. And I suddenly realized that there was a past when Jerusalem was the kind of place that I would like Jerusalem to be today. 
uh, where Jews, Christians, and Muslims at least know about one another a little more than at present. And so, again, uh, walking through the streets of Jerusalem is always for me an exercise of wherever I am, trying to bring all the rest of Jerusalem with me so that this wonderful experience of its diversity, the colors, the smells, the sounds, can really become something a lot more harmonious in these times when we live with so much tension and violence. I must say that I feel very emotional at the moment. Um, in my own work, I, I worked on diaries and memoirs of the late 19th century, early 20th century, talking about the stories you just told us about, uh, you know, obviously interacting with each other, uh, you know, whether it was Sukkot, Purim, Ramadan, uh, Christmas, but communities interacted with each other. And, and when you hear now stories, um, and I have goosebumps, I really, because it's different when you hear stories about the, the 70s and then the 80s, and you get to see that memory is still very much alive. But nowadays, that memory is, is gone. And you're right, the, the city has been polarized to the point that it's even hard to talk about uh, uh, these stories. I want to ask you something about the city. You moved there in 1977, and, and essentially there is there is this decade before the first Intifada, where there were no borders, no barriers. Obviously, the West Bank was under occupation, but as many other Palestinian guests mentioned, people traveled, people visited the city. Uh, you know, relatives throughout the the countryside or other towns and cities. And I was wondering, you as a teenager moving into your 20s, how did you experience the city? Going around, meeting people, restaurants, clubs, cafes, form of entertainment, anything really? So, of course, for me, the great discovery was moving out of Jewish Jerusalem. And that doesn't only mean geographical. It also means the concept of a Jewish Jerusalem having spent the first 15 years very much within a Jewish diaspora milieu, with Jerusalem as a constant refrain, it was moving out of that and realizing that Jerusalem is not ours in that kind of very parochial way. That Jerusalem can only be ours if that very parochial sense of uh, ownership is broadened to include all Jerusalemites. And so walking around with Usama, realizing that when I go to church, I'm moving into a whole Jerusalem world, that all of these Jerusalems intertwine. So those first 10 years when indeed there was openness, as you say, and people were moving around and you went to the old city and found Israelis thronging there on Saturdays, or even beyond uh, in Bethlehem, Bechala, Israelis going to do their shopping, which you don't find anymore after the first intifada. I think that what is, for me, the real um, broadening was to realize that any kind of parochial Jerusalem is not Jerusalem. The parochial Jerusalem is destroying the Jerusalem that I want to want to live in. And that's a Jerusalem which is as Jewish as it is Christian, as it is Muslim. Okay, again, I keep on referring to these religious groupings, and I need to say that in my own experience as a religious person, this was very, very central. But, but I'm a peculiar type of religious person because I feel as comfortable in a synagogue as I do in a church. And because of Usama, okay, and again, it's this is more vicarious, because of Usama, I feel very comfortable sitting next to him reading uh, the text of the Quran while he does his praying in a mosque. And to realize that uh, this is truly what, what is the uniqueness of Jerusalem, uh, the fact that here all are called to be at home and that no one can own Jerusalem. We are owned by Jerusalem. Okay, and again, the passion to walk around the the... The, the memories that are stirred and not just personal memories, but historical memory and the hopes that are stoked. And again, not just personal hopes, but kind of eschatological hopes that 
come together in the present of a desire that people would really respect one another, be curious about one another, want to explore one another's worlds, and be grateful for what the other brings to the city of Jerusalem on every level. Again, we can go back to the smells, to the sounds, to the sights, uh, that this city has been constructed over so many centuries of history that it simply would not be Jerusalem if it was only this, that, or the other. It needs to be all of it together. I hope you're going to take this as a compliment, but uh, what you were just saying, some sort of a painted picture of you as a man of another century, uh, of the century when communities were really looking at each other, but also learning about each other. I mean, nowadays it's hard to think about Christians reading uh, uh, the Talmud or, or the Quran and vice versa, but uh, certainly there was a culture around Jerusalem for which communities understood each other also in understanding their own texts. There's plenty of examples in history where people were obviously very familiar with reading each other's uh, sacred text. So Christians knew the Quran and the part of the Talmud and the Jews the same. Uh, there was this, uh, as you said, and I would call it comparticipation, but also that shows that Jerusalem owns you and you don't own Jerusalem. And you, you also need to make an effort to live in the city, to know the others, because that's what it is. So only one little comment on what you just said, and I'm not sure if you gave me a compliment or not, but I would have preferred if you would have said, rather than you remind me of a Jerusalemite of the past, I would want to add, I hope that I provoke you to think of a Jerusalemite of the future, uh, because I think that this is our hope. Our hope is to realize, and I don't see any sparks of hope right now, but that doesn't mean that they will not come. Remember, I come from South Africa and I lived through utter darkness, and then suddenly the dawn broke. I hope that something similar will happen here, and that dawn will only break when people once again realize that for a Jew to understand Jerusalem, they need to become completely immersed in Christian and Muslim Jerusalem. If a Muslim wants to understand Jerusalem, they need to become immersed in Jewish and Christian Jerusalem, etc., etc. Are that Jerusalem simply is not one, it is plural. And that plurality uh, is exactly its uniqueness. And we as residents of Jerusalem, have this wonderful privilege of being able in such a small space to be exposed to so many different worlds. It was a compliment, and <laughs> I take your point. I want to ask you something. You've been a priest for a, a number of years, and, and I wonder how does it feel to walk around the city of Jerusalem dressed, visibly dressed as a Catholic priest. People know who you are. People immediately can connect your identity through your clothing. Um, how do you personally feel about it? So let me be perfectly honest with you before we get into any kind of mythological language that most of the time I deliberately choose to walk around Jerusalem not dressed as a Catholic priest. I do that because I also want to live as a Jerusalemite without being put in a box. I take enormous delight, perhaps even perverse delight, in uh, this particularly happens when I pick up people who are hitching, who, who want a ride, uh, how do you say, auto stoppers, or I forgot how you say in decent English, are people who need to get from one place to another and they ask you to stop the car and take them. Hitchhikers. Yes, hitchhikers, thank fine. you, hitchhikers. Yes. And I inevitably do a kind of game with them. They don't know it's a game, but I speak the language they speak. So if they're speaking Arabic, then I speak Arabic. If they speak Hebrew, then I speak Hebrew. And we start the conversation and then I switch to be the opposite of what they are. So if they're Jewish, I pretend I'm an Arab. If they're Arab, I pretend to be a Jew. And that's when I'm not wearing funny clothes as a Christian. When I do wear funny clothes as a Christian, I also want to know how people relate uh, 
to who Christians have been in the history of Jerusalem, and it's a very complicated issue, okay, to be very sensitive to the fact that for Jews, Christians are an overwhelmingly negative presence in their history. Again, going back to what my mother's reaction was when I said, I want to be a Christian. But also for Muslims, uh, to realize that Muslims have a long historical memory, and the Crusades were only yesterday, and the colonial masters arriving and taking over the Middle East was just this morning. Uh, these are very vivid memories. And to take that on, uh, not to deny it or to justify it, but really to start a conversation from that place of woundedness. By the way, one of the most powerful experiences I had was going to visit a Greek Orthodox monastery where the monks were not very enthusiastic to let me in with the group of pilgrims I was leading because I was dressed as a Catholic cleric very clearly. And so uh, when he finally opened the door because I rang the bell so much, he threw open the door and he looked at the pilgrims and said, okay, I'll let you in on condition no one prays. And so we stood in the courtyard of the monastery and I said to the pilgrims, he was watching that we were not praying. I said to the pilgrims, you're obviously quite surprised to be greeted in this fashion, but let's put it into a context. Do you remember when we came here as crusaders and we massacred Muslims, Jews, and Eastern Christians? Do you remember when we came here as imperial and colonial overlords and we intended to convert all the Jews and Muslims? hardly converted anybody. So who did we convert and take from their own churches? The Orthodox. And the monk at that point disappeared. And we visited the monastery. And when I was leaving, I wanted to say thank you to him. And he came out of a room, which turned out to be the refectory. He walked straight up to me and he took me by the shoulder and said, no, no, don't leave. Please come in with me and have something to drink because Ah, I have prepared for you on this hot day something to drink. So the opportunities for, for conversation, for dialogue, and of course, ah, for some kind of humble reconciliation are there all the time when you're a Christian in Jerusalem. And I think that it's wonderful to be able to take up the challenge, ah, to discover, to touch ah, those moments of hurt, yeah, absolutely. Memory is short in some communities and very long in others. But I think we will all we all should make the effort to remember that we come to some places because of what happened before. And forgetting can be useful, but sometimes uh, uh, it's also problematic. We need to be aware of what happens, particularly when we talk about Jerusalem. I mean, people always forget what. Uh, the West did, what the other people contributed, and so forth. We are going to take a short break. Thank you for listening. And remember to join our Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram account. If you have a story about Jerusalem that you want to share, or someone that you want me to interview, please get in touch. Enjoy the rest of the show. And talking about memory, I want to bring you back to your former job. So from 2009 to 2017, you served as a uh, vicar for the Hebrew speaking Catholics uh, in the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Now, the, the question of the Hebrew speaking Catholic is a big one, and perhaps we can touch upon it briefly. But uh, attached to this job, you were also um, the vicar, so you were taking care uh, of the migrants. Uh, arriving uh, in Israel. Now, not many people know that there are actually migrants living in Israel. Sometimes these are forgotten, neglected, or shadowed. They live in these, you know, different neighborhoods. They get in touch with the local people only because of work, but they are unseen. And I think this is like the way I see them. Like they, they are unseen. I see them walking, shopping in the various supermarkets, but they're not really part of, of, of the city. So I was wondering if you can tell us a, a little bit more about who are these people, where do they come from, um, 
how do they live in the city and how do they relate to the city if you heard any story about them so of course <clears throat> this needs a little bit of background uh, that um, the migrants that we are speaking about are labor migrants and asylum seekers two different kinds of migrants who arrive in israel most of them go to the economic center of the country in tel aviv but of course many of them who are christian or muslim and that would include the vast majority are uh, the majority are christian but also some muslims for them jerusalem would also be like a kind of dream so of course we are talking about people who live in very extreme circumstances they live on the margins of society their biggest issue is simply to survive from day to day um the ones who are labor migrants work in very difficult jobs uh, earn money that is in most times sent immediately back to their families that they've left behind the asylum seekers are kind of stuck here in a in a in a kind of limbo uh, not knowing what tomorrow will bring they meet with a lot of racism a lot of uh, discrimination they have very little rights but uh, when it comes to jerusalem and certainly many have a traditional faith what one discovers is the the resilience that that gives them the the fact that they can celebrate and be joyful despite the awful circumstances that they live in and coming to jerusalem for them is is like a dream come true uh, if you think that we have here many many asylum seekers from eritrea who have embarked on the most hor horrendous journey to try and get to a place of safety and when they arrive in that place of safety are tre treated almost like criminals to see them coming for great liturgical celebrations in jerusalem you would never realize that these people have suffered are uh, all clothed in white the men and the women are engaging in an outpouring of joy and the very very clear and vivid realization that they are participating in something of an absolute privilege that people that they've left behind could never dream of that they are actually entering are uh, the tomb of christ they're actually standing at calvary they're actually walking in the city of jerusalem where jesus lived it's an amazing thing for them and our big challenge of church uh, is to draw on that to to make that a, a a source of inspiration for their lives here so as you said yes i had a ecclesial responsibility as the episcopal vicar responsible for the hebrew speaking catholics and the migrants for a number of years and the job part of it was very much concerned with passing on this energy to the new generation that is born here the new generation of migrants so in jerusalem the community is much smaller than in tel aviv we were very active in tel aviv setting up our kinds of structures that could accommodate these people uh, meeting places prayer places but even more than that trying to allow them to organize themselves so that what gives them strength and what gives them joy can really become a mainstay of their lives here in this country do you think these migrants are sort of long-term connected uh, with uh, whether tel aviv jerusalem or other uh, cities around israel or, or or just their presence temporary i mean in other words do you, do you think there may be a built up also in terms of hope for the future uh, relying on migrants so of course i mean that that question too is a complex one because of course we know that jerusalem has always been a place where migrants have come to rest we have in the holy land an important armenian community ah uh, that is a migrant community to some extent but way and beyond the armenians look at what has happened in the 20th century with the jewish population ah uh, a migrant population um now it's very interesting to realize that the migrant population that is here has given birth to a new generation that is born here and that new generation feels itself part and parcel of this land 
What does that exactly mean? Well, it's complex. We can't go into it right now. <clears throat> but certainly the children who are born here and speak the language Hebrew in general, although some also speak Arabic, and have now set down some kind of existential route here, it becomes almost cruel to think that at some point they will be expelled. Now, for the meantime, I think that the majority of the Jewish population would like to see them expelled. Ah, this, this land in ideological terms is seen as a Jewish homeland. And if you're not Jewish, you should not feel rooted here. But will these processes, processes change as the society, the, the migrant society, becomes more and more embedded? We don't know. Uh, there are interesting sociological, and they might even be very troubling for some people, but three weeks ago at mass, uh, here in the Jesuit house, a mother who I've known for many years, I've known her since her children were very small, brought her son to mass, and in a very natural way came up after mass and said, could you please bless Ryan on Thursday, he's being mobilized into the Israeli army. Now, that was kind of a shock for many people in the in the uh, assembly. We have a mass in English that attracts Palestinians, but also some Hebrew speaking Catholics. It's the last mass of the day uh, celebrated at the latest hour. So we always get a kind of very mixed assembly. And I kind of looked at the boy and looked at her and said, I cannot refuse to bless him. So I blessed him. I blessed him in terms of may God protect him, keep him safe and keep him safe from doing anything uh, that would be opposed to the teaching of Jesus. And he went off happy and the mother was relieved and the people in the assembly were forced to deal with the fact that, you know, here in the midst of the church, we have to open our arms and embrace this new population that is coming to us in all of its poverty. Um, yeah, confusing, but pushing us to a place where, to answer your question, my hope is that Jerusalem will indeed embrace these people. The whole land will embrace these people and allow them to feel that they are as, ho as at home here as all of us. It feels you're talking about some form of new melting pot, perhaps very different from the American experience or other forms of melting pot. And yet, when I am in Jerusalem and, and often uh, I work in uh, parts of uh, East Jerusalem, I feel an experience, even though I, I'm obviously not a local, <laughs> but I can feel this sort of a sense of apartheid growing. Maybe apartheid is not the right word, Others prefer segregation, but yet you can see the differences. You know, there is a there is a line dividing people, and it's real, and it's not it's not just uh, politics or perception. So, how do you see this dichotomy? Do, do you think there is maybe a way to bridge uh, that? Uh, particularly, you know, in your own experience, you grew up in South Africa, you experienced that, you saw that happening. So first, just a, a word, and then I'll get on to your main question. I do not like the image of melting pot because I do not want all of this great diversity to be melted down into some kind of uniformity. I'd like all of the diversity to be preserved and for us all to rejoice in that diversity. So just to say the melting pot, you know, the, the North American or New World melting pot, I don't think is for Jerusalem. Now, <clears throat> I tend not to use the word apartheid. Apartheid refers to a very specific uh, experience in South Africa. I think that we need to develop a language that is precise and incisive for our situation. I think that what we have here is a situation of enormous discrimination, okay? Ideological ethnocentricity that is extremely exclusive and has created a system which is very, very dangerous. And I would say that in some senses, it's worse than apartheid, because you know, in the apartheid regime, no one uh, um, disputed the legitimate presence of black people in South Africa. 
There was no idea that they should be expelled. They were at home. OK, apartheid was just that they were inferior. Whereas here there is the real sense that we need to do away with these people, whatever that means. And of course, the most extreme of the of the doing away with it people, uh, uh, they border on horrible experiences that we know from history. So I think that, yes, we are moving more and more into ideological polarization, but at the same time that forces a lot of people who probably do not reveal themselves right now as kind of instruments of change in the future. But I think that what is happening is that these exclusive nationalist ideologies, and in a very particular way Zionism, are becoming more and more unpalatable to more and more people who maybe at one point will realize uh, that this is the completely wrong direction. Again, I come out of the South African experience. The worst period in South African history was the middle of the 1980s. It was the most violent, the most repressive. Less than 10 years later, the apartheid system had collapsed. And that's not only because of sanctions, which worked, but also because many white people began to realize that this just doesn't work. Uh, we cannot continue like this. And so I, I kind of hope that in the, in the face of this incredibly revolting extremism, that there are more and more people, even if they are not saying it loud and clear, that there are more and more people being able to look critically at what all of this ideology is about and how impoverishing it is for what this land could be. Wise words. There is another conflict in Jerusalem, one that has been going on for millennia, I would say, uh, related to the holy places of Jerusalem, whether within the same community, so between Christians or between then different communities, Christian, Jews and Muslims. I was wondering, at a personal level, in your path to conversion, how did you negotiate th these conflicts? How did they play any role? How did you look at them? Did you, you know, feel uncomfortable about the fact that actually there is a conflict over what should be about understanding and Christian love, in particular when we talk about Christian holy places? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I suppose that in the beginning I tried to ignore those conflicts, but you cannot because you are constantly brought face to face with them. And so then it is really the attempt to cross borders as much as possible with a sense of pride in disobeying the rules. OK, so it's a kind of um, how do you say that in good English? You, you're deliberately breaking rules with pride. And so I don't know if this is a productive way of, of really bringing down uh, the walls that have been erected because of so many centuries of conflict, but I don't think I'm alone in this. I think once again that if you're speaking about the conflicts within the Christian community, I think that one of the ways we deal with it is that when people come and say, what confession, what denomination do you belong to? We say, we're Christian. And then they say, no, 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 I know you're Christian, but are you Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant? And then the answer is, ah, have you come to divide us up? You know, to kind of resist some of the ways in which this denominationalism, this confessionalism is propagated very often by a small group that has interests in us remaining apart, often clergy, sometimes even our hierarchy, uh, and to resist that. What has become even more challenging is when it comes to not only the divisions among Christians, but divisions between Christians and Muslims or Christians and, uh, and Jews. I'll give you an example. Just a few weeks ago, I walked past a store in the old city that I saw was open. And because the economy is so bad, I said, oh, I'd like to buy 
some nice tiles, ceramic tiles to hang in our house. And I walked in and realized that the young man who was sitting there, his father is a wonderful calligrapher. And so I found two tiles uh, with expressions in Arabic written one, uh, praise God, alhamdulillah, and the other, whatever God wants, mashallah. Beautifully, beautiful tiles. And I said, I'm going to take these two and put them in our entrance, which I did. And uh, two days later, a young Christian man from the old city came to see me. And as he was going out, he could not but notice the two tiles. And he said to me, why did you put their tiles in your house? And I immediately knew what he meant. Huh? What he meant was, this is supposedly Muslim. Okay, every Christian says, Alhamdulillah, Masha'Allah. But, you know, using that kind of calligraphical, calligraphical art in that particular form looks Muslim. And I said, what do you mean there? Is this not ours? And again, the challenge of breaking down this secure, very ethnocentric sense of what is us and what is them. And it started a long, long conversation that went on for about an hour and a half about this supposedly clear division between them and us. And the attempt to point out that much of his language was based upon very superficial judgments, whether it was about Islam or about the history of the Holy Land or about Muslim Christian relations. Now, I try to do that even when it comes to Jews. OK, I've I wrote a book two years ago. I, it was my just after I finished being the vicar, I had time to sit down and do a writing project. And I wrote a book that I've always dreamed of writing, and that is a history of a, a, sorry, an introduction to Judaism for Arabs written in our uh, uh, translated into Arabic. But uh, I worked hand in hand with the Arabic translator. And again, to present the Jews not as some kind of foreign entity having come in, which is, of course, true when we refer to the Zionist migrations at the end of the 19th century. But the book is entitled Judaism Developed Among Us in Arabic. OK, as an introduction to Judaism for Arabs who I am trying to promote the idea that Jews were always part of this world. Of course, not some Russian Jew who arrived in 1880 or, or in 1970, but the, the Jewish Arabs, the Jews who were part and parcel of Arab civilization. And the book is predominantly illustrated with illustrations taken from the Jewish Arab world of Jewish Arab communities, whether in Tunis, in Jerusalem or in Damascus. But really, again, this attempt to break down are these these fixed divisions that seem so clear to everyone when they shouldn't be, ah, when they shouldn't be, because here we are, ah, and we are a product of, of this city that holds us together, whether we like it or whether we don't. I just want to say that when I look at my mother-in-law from Iraq, I mean, she has much more in common with the Palestinian women sitting around the old city, you know, just to, dealing with vegetables and fruit than certainly with a, a Russian Jewish woman from from the pay. Let's use the old name or, or what it was, uh, not just in terms of language, but also in terms of uh, like daily culture, food and, uh, you know, it's the uh, smells, colors and sounds that we talked about. Uh, exactly. Common... But also common values that are shared because it's sort of a lens that they grew up in. And, you know, this is what they really share. So that. That's always fascinating. Yeah, yeah. We're reaching the end of the of the interview, and I have uh, just a, one more question. You know, again, bringing it back to uh, you, uh, David Neuhaus, you've been a resident uh, of Jerusalem for nearly all of your life. So I was wondering, when you go around the city, if you have a couple of spots that you feel like you are very much attached places that they make you just take a deep breath and connect even deeper with the city itself. So there are a number of places like that. 
I will start with the expected. Uh, and the expected, of course, is standing or sitting often early on Friday morning at Golgotha uh, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, or as we call it, the Church of the Resurrection, but sitting when it's very quiet and praying. Yes, I'm religious, so I pray, but I do something else more than I pray, I'll admit, and that is watch the people coming into the church. Early, early in the morning, you don't see the tourists. You see the, the people of Jerusalem, mostly women, uh, who are coming to caress the, the, the places, uh, caress the stones, and know that they are intimately communing with God. And what is so wonderful being there on Friday is that very regularly there will be also Muslims coming into the church. Uh, Muslims who have come to Jerusalem to go and pray in the mosque, they come to, to, to the church, they revere Jesus, and so they come there as well. So this is one place at a particular time that I put at the top of the list, okay? But there are many other places that are more profane. I don't know if you know the place for Knafi that is called Ja'far, uh, near to Damascus Gate. But sitting there, and I have sat there for 43 years because Usama, I, and a number of our friends would go there and have knafi eating competitions when we were teenagers. <laughs> but still going to sit there and just watching the, the people passing by and saying, what a privilege to be a part of this. What a privilege to be a part of this mass of humanity some of whom are happy to be together, some of whom look at each other with hatred and wish the other person didn't exist. But just knowing that this is the place that, that in some small way is where I belong. And finally, a third place would be a rooftop looking onto the Haram al-Sharif. And you can also see the top of the Western Wall. It's a, it's a rooftop which nowadays is much more frequented than it used to be. But in the old days when I used to go up there, it was a lot more abandoned and a lot less frequented. And the sounds and smells would, would kind of waft up, uh, especially on hot summer nights. And watching Jerusalem and praying there, praying there for the peace of Jerusalem, praying for a spirit of understanding to come over the people of Jerusalem that they would wake up the next morning and realize that their neighbor is a blessing to them and not a curse. And so at least those three places are very special places for me, all in the old city of Jerusalem. Of course, there'd be a myriad of places in other parts of the city. This was Father David Neuhaus, currently superior of the Jesuits in the Holy Land and Interim Director of the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Jerusalem. David, thank you so much for this amazing interview. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Jerusalem Unplugged. This podcast is currently commercial free. There are no ads. The only possibility to stay this way is for you to please let your friends, your family, and others who may be interested in listening to Jerusalem Unplugged know about this podcast. Let's increase the audience and let's keep the podcast commercial free. Thank you for listening. Until the next one.